People don't vote for a candidate today. They vote against a candidate. It's all about, well, I, I don't like either one of them, but this one over there is even worse. And so I'm going to take the lesser of two evils. See, that's the trick. All right. G. Edward Griffin, it's an honor to have you here on Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, well, thanks for inviting me back. We've done this before. A lot of fun. Yeah, we're uh, we're going to talk about a few things today. Uh, we're going to talk about The Creature from Jekyll Island, which is an amazing book. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about your interview with Yuri Bezmenov. Um, but w- first, I wanted to give a little introduction. So you're an author, you're a lecturer, uh, speaker, and uh, filmmaker and founder of Red Pill University. Is there anything that you would like to add on top of that for listeners to know? <laughs> uh, that's uh, that's That list is good enough, I think. Uh, I guess all of that is, I'm a curiosity seeker, and I, I get curious about things, and I think I've wasted all my youth uh, pursuing interesting things to me that don't make any difference to anybody else in the world. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a sucker for looking up something very serious on the internet, reading a, a document uh, with a lot of technical information, and uh, the darn video company throws it on the side of the screen a bunch of little pictures of wouldn't you like to see this or wouldn't you like to see that of course they know exactly what i'm interested in so they have me nailed and i get sidetracked i i pursue those little things it, it's costing me my life i think uh, so to answer your question i just uh, i i have no self-control i pursue a lot of things that just interest me that's all so wikipedia is uh really garbage it's it's not a great source of information and uh especially when you get into the political realm and a lot of our the ai models that we see are, are trained off with a lot of the same information when i look you up on wikipedia and i also had a conversation with grok uh xai's ai uh wikipedia says you're a right-wing conspiracy theorist and uh grok when i asked if you're right wing it says yes and it, i said why and I, it starts listing off the reasons that it gives. And for all of them, I'm like, well, those aren't necessarily right-wing positions. So what actually makes him right-wing other than just being called right-wing? So I'd love to ask you, do you consider yourself right-wing? And what do you think of that? <laughs> no, the the short answer is no, I definitely do not consider myself uh, a right-winger. Although to make this uh, answer complete, there was a time that I did think I was. Now, I haven't changed in my, in my thinking, but I've changed in my understanding of what that word really means, or in this case, what it really does not mean. And so when I became aware that uh, there are a lot of words out there like right wing and uh, versus left wing, they're, they're always, these words usually have opposites attached to them. So people get involved in them because they're expected to make a choice. Well, what are you, a right winger or a left winger? Now, they don't say, or something else. That's never part of the equation. You have to choose between two. I mean, that's what they like you to think. And usually we fall for it, especially if we're young and we don't know how these tricks are being played. And there was a time back in the 1960s when I first became aware of what's going on in the world. And of course, we were all rightfully concerned about the expansion of communism around the world. I mean, these. These uh, people have taken over Russia and China, and they were on our doorstep at Cuba. They were in, taking over South America, and we see them on the streets in the USA. And if you, you can't be concerned over that. And then we see all the evidence of the firing squads and the uh, concentration camps and the tortures and all the horrible things that came with Nazism and all that stuff. Uh, and as uh, so we said, well, okay. Uh, communism, of course, we're talking about that in the day. No, Nazism was bad enough, but it didn't seem to be a threat to us. Hmm. But communism did. And so we were, we all thought we, who were concerned about these things, we all thought we were anti-communists, okay? All right, so rightfully so. I mean, that wasn't a bad position to hold. Yeah. We felt, and still is not a bad position. But we were given that false choice then. Well, if you're if you're not a communist, then what's the opposite of communism? If communism is extreme left and the extreme right is Nazism or fascism, well, which one are you? 
And I fell into that trap. I thought, well, I'm, I'm certainly not a communist. And I have to be on the other side. So I didn't like the word Nazi. I didn't think I would ever be a Nazi or anything like that. But I, I got the impression from what I was reading in the newspapers and hearing on the radio and all that, that the opposite of uh, the left wing, wing was to be on the right wing. So I stepped right into the trap. And I used to proudly refer to myself as, well, I'm a right winger, you know, a responsible right winger. So now I know better because I, I've had a few more years uh, at, the, uh, at the controls there. And I, I realized that all of these words where we have these false choices between the two extremes, like left and right, between communism and Nazism, between socialism and capitalism, whatever that is, and, uh, between uh, Republicans and Democrats, uh, repeat, repeat, between uh, conservatives and liberals. I mean, you go down the list of this endless list of these names, and they always come in opposites. And we are expected, we who are not alert, are expected to choose one. Yeah. And now I realize that almost, no, I won't say all, all of those cases, not almost all of them, all of those cases, it's a trap. Because when you really dig into it, you find there's very little difference, if any, between either one. And you have to choose one side or the other. And that's how we go down the slippery slope and give up our freedoms and willingly give away our, our liberties in return for this, this great battle against evil. Because we think we're on the, on the correct side because we hate the other side. And I just wrap this up by saying that today we, we certainly see that in politics. For, for as long as I can remember, people didn't vote for a candidate. People don't vote for a candidate today. They yeah. vote against a candidate. It's all about, well, I, I don't like either one of them, but this one over there is even worse. And so I'm going to take the lesser of two evils. See, that's the trick. And they're both the same, except they appear... Depends on which side you're on. The, the, the other side appears to be worse than your side. Yeah. And I discovered that we were fighting communism all this time, the 60s and the 70s. And all the while we were doing it, we were creating in America a political system. We're converting it away from the foundational principles that we had when the Constitution was written. All of that was being eroded away and gradually chipped away and, and through a couple of world wars where you, you can't worry too much about principles. You know, we got to win the war, man. And during those periods of crisis when, when, when reason was thrown to the wind because we were afraid of losing something, and uh, we, were able to, we were able to justify giving up our liberties in order to defend ourselves against this great enemy. Well, People on both sides decided who was the enemy. People on the left thought the right was the enemy. People on the right thought the left was the enemy. And now we look back, and here's my, here's my punchline and the answer to your question. I discovered some time ago when I really got serious about researching this, that left and right were the same. The same wings, just opposite wings, I should say, on the same ugly bird called collectivism. There's a single word that covers all of these things, and that is collectivism. We used to have that word in the English vocabulary. I was amazed to find out that all the old books, and by that I mean 100 years or more, 150, 200 years ago, if you're reading any of the, of the works by the, the philosophers, the political philosophers who were dealing with these issues, they used the word collectivism versus individualism quite a bit. Everybody knew what those words meant. But by the time we came out of World War I, and by, surely by the time we were in the middle of World War II, it was apparently decided by the powers that be, if you want to use throw another word into the mix here, that people shouldn't think about collectivism versus individualism because it was too clear. And so since, the, since World War II, for sure, nobody in the world hardly ever even heard of or thought of the words collectivism versus individualism. So now to answer your question, no, I'm not a right winger. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be any more than I want to be a left winger. <laughs> but I want to be, and I am, an individualist. And that means I'm the opposite of all of these totalitarian systems, which are built on the principle of collectivism. And the mantra of collectivism, just to sort of narrow this down a little bit so we can 
move on to other topics, if you wish. The mantra of collectivism is that the group is more important than the individual and that the individual must be sacrificed, if necessary, for the greater good of the greater number. Now, I was taught that in school. I believed it. I came out of the university. I thought, oh, yeah, that that's just sounds right. It's democracy, right? The majority rules. The greater good of the greater number, what could be, what could be better than that? Well, I didn't understand uh, I didn't much about political theory, political science. So now I know that I'm not a, I'm not a collectivist. I am an individualist. And uh, so that's how I answer the question nowadays. But then that leads to the very interesting topic. Well, what the heck is individualism versus collectivism? And I, um, I'm glad you brought that up because about three or four months ago, I decided this topic was so important. And I was working on a book, which I'm still working on, which would be a showcase for um, an illustration of what these principles mean and how they evolved over history. But it's taking me so bloody long to finish the book, I decided a few months ago, I would take the data that I had already compiled on this topic and put it together in a, uh, a booklet. And I'm, I want people to read it. And uh, so I'm offering it free if anybody wants to know what I've discovered on this journey about individualism and collectivism. And this is, this is what it looks like. It's uh, called The Chasm. And uh, it's, uh, it's for 50 pages. And I don't think you'll find it dull. It's pretty serious stuff. And um, I have talked to a lot of people who thought they were collectivists of one kind or another, uh, mostly socialists, because the Karl Marx had the great ability to present his theories in such a way that they sounded humanitarian. And so people naturally go for it. They like it. They like it. I liked it when I read first time I read all these slogans that Karl Marx came up with, such as uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Mm-hmm. Well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> that sounds yeah. great to me. That sounds like Christian principles of charity to me. But then when you dig a little further, you come to the next question. Not only what do you want to do in society, but how do you want to do it? And that's the big divide between collectivism and individualism. Both collectivists and individualists want the same thing from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. But the individualist says, we want to to make the choice of who is in need and who has surplus. And we want to give to to whom we want to give and the amounts we want to give. And if we decide we don't want to give, we don't want to give. That's it. We want to be free to make those choices. But the collectivists say, oh, no, no, no. These are too big. (laughs) Issues are too big for you to decide. We will decide how who is needy and who has more than they need, and we will decide how much they will give, and so forth. So it's the question of, are you going to do these good things under the, under the umbrella of liberty and freedom of choice, or are you going to do it under the command principle of the great leader or the state telling you what to do and what not to do for not only your own good, but the greater good of the greater number? So that is the, that is the, the essence, essence behind all of the problems of our world today, believe it or not. And if you're interested in learning more about that, I hope you'll, you'll order this. It just, it's a free download. And to get it, you just go online and type in uh, the words chasm. You can see it here. It's C-H-A-S-M. And that represents this big divide, this big canyon, big divide between two positions. So it's chasm, C-H-A-S-M, um, dot reality zone, all one word, dot com. So it's chasm dot reality dot com and we'll send you this and you can download it and I hope you like it and you can print off as many copies as you wish. Yeah, I will definitely get that. Um I hope a lot of listeners do too. So one of the things that goes through my head is I'm definitely an individualist. I think individuals I mean collectives are collections of individuals. So I think the best way to protect a collective is by protecting the rights of any individual in the collective. But I often describe myself, or when I talk about this kind of stuff, I, I usually focus on authoritarianism because I'm, I'm very much against authoritarianism. And I would uh, align myself with more with like libertarian, uh, small L libertarian values. It seems like we're kind of dealing with the same thing, right? Because libertarian would be more individualist authoritarian 
doesn't need to be collective, but collectivism is often the the cry of authoritarians, right? Well, that's it. That's it precisely. Uh, there, the authoritarian principle can be uh, can be applied. Well, take a look at history. Uh, authoritarians or tyrants, uh, despots, in the olden days uh, achieved their their status by the sword. They had the biggest armies, and they defeated their opponents, and they were they had the authority by contest, uh, military contest, and the winner takes all. So that was authoritarianism, but it was not collectivism. It's just plain old might makes right sort of thing. Yeah. So um, it's a little different. The end result is the same, but the banner on, under which it flies is different. The authoritarians of old, who were the military victors, uh, they didn't bother trying to convince everybody it was for their own good. They just said, if you want to live, you will do what I tell you to do, and you will pay homage to the king, and you will pay tribute to the king. Otherwise, uh, we'll come and take off with your head. So there was no greater good for the greatest number in those days, but that evolved over a period of time. Mm-hmm. And now it's now that is the mantra. We, you will do what we tell you to do or off with your head, but the reason is not because we won the war and we, we had superior military might. It's because it's for your own good mm-hmm. and the betterment of society, you see. So it's the rationale. The end product is the same, but the explanation or the justification, the morality of it has changed. And that is a huge change because the human being is, is wired for morality. We have this instinct in all of us, most of us anyway, that we want to do the right thing. Uh, we don't always do it, of course, but we want to do the right thing. And it's built into us. So when they can convince us that we have to do horrendous things, terrible things, as uh, as Lenin would Lenin said in his own writings, he said, "In order to make an omelet, you have to crack some eggs." Okay, that was the idea. You know, it's for, it's for the greater good of the greater number. You have got to lose a few eggs in order to preserve all the other eggs. So it was a, kind of a mathematical equation: how many eggs get cracked and how many eggs are not. Yeah. Anyway, back to your point, and you're absolutely correct. Authoritarianism is one of the traits of collectivism. Um, but it's also one of the traits of military militarism too. So, if, to be clear, we got to separate collectivism is authoritarianism based on the principle of it's for your own good and the greater good of the greater number. Hmm. Are there any you as an individualist? Are there any collective arguments that you still have maybe trouble? applying an individualist perspective on or or arguing against maybe yes yes i do i'd be perfectly honest with you um and uh, although i always come out with the answer but i don't like the answer but it's based on principle and so any other answer is not based on principle so i like that even less and that is the issue of uh uh, I don't know if I could give it a name. It had to do with like uh, zoning. Let me back up a little bit here. The principle here that we're dealing with here is um, another element of the difference between collectivism and individualism. One of those principles is that individualists believe that their rights, their human rights, come with them. They're hardwired with them. They're born with them. Uh, depending on your religious point of view, you say, well, they're God-given rights. If you're not sure about that, you can say, well, at least I don't know who gave them to me, but I got them and they're mine. And when I was born, I had them. I'm hardwired. It's like the difference between computer hardware and software. Mm. Rights are not added to the hardware. They come with the hardware. So yeah. individualists believe that, believe that, but collectivists believe that rights are granted to the individual by the state. That's all collectivist um, concepts that we've been talking about. Believe that, that they have to, because you see the state in their mind means them. That means they're controlling the state. They're the wise ones, you see. And they always imagine in their minds that they're the ones who are determining what the state 
is supposed to do and not do. So they, they're really talking about their own power, and the, but they express it by calling it the state. So if it's the principle that I believe in and all coll- individuals believe in is that the state derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. Hmm. Okay? I think most people say, yeah, I believe in that too. The governed must do it. And in, in, in the United States, we created a whole government based on the principle, we the people created the Constitution. We the people declared that we were sovereign. We were the source of all authority. And we were going to delegate authority to this thing we created called the state, the government. So if we believe that the state the, uh, derives its just powers from the, um, the, the governed, so to speak, or from the citizens, then the question, the really important question is, well, what do we as individuals have a right to give to the state? All right. That's a big question. Nobody ever thinks about that. What are our rights? Well, what rights are we talking about? When we talk about the state or government, we're talking about the legalized use of coercion, physical force, and even lethal force. That's what government is. Lethal Hmm. force, if necessary. So it's a big, big issue. It's serious. If we're going to authorize somebody, we say, I'm going to give you a gun and an ammunition. I'm going to pay for it. And I'm going to authorize you to use this gun on anybody you wish, including me. I better think, oh, don't I want some restrictions in this granting of power? Or do we just say, go ahead, have a good time, see how it works out? That's how we've been doing it, by the way. We say, we'll create the government. We say, okay, now we have an election. And who won the election? Well, they can do whatever they want to now. Yeah. It's the same principle. It's bad thinking, very bad thinking. So back to my point. If it is true that the state d- derives its power to use coercion against us all from us all, then the question is, what do we as individuals have a right to use coercion, violence, and even lethal force against another human being? Well, that narrows the field <laughs> Quite a bit. There are many cases. One of them, I think most people would agree. If we had to use that kind of force to defend our own lives, if somebody was trying to kill us, nobody or very few would condemn us for having, from taking their own, the other, the attacker's life in order to defend yourself, if it's an act of defense. So there's one. That's one element that we can give to the state, uh, uh, the power to use okay. lethal force to defend our lives. Anything else? Well, there's one other. What if they're trying to enslave us? They don't want to kill us, but they just want to put us in chains for the rest of our life or torture us or just keep us in chains like they're slave. Most people would say that is the equivalent of life because what good is life if you're a slave? And so most people, and I'm one of them, would say, yes, I think that is an innate right that we have to defend with lethal force if necessary. Okay, so we can give to the state the power to use lethal force against any of us in the defense of our lives or liberty. What else? Zero else. Hmm. Zero else. That's it. And now that means that all the laws that, that we see passed by the people whom we elect, who we elect, Take a look at them and see, do they meet that test? And I'm, I'm sad to say, if you look at the laws that we have on the books, I'm going to guess that it probably 95% of them violate this principle. The people vote to give to their elected representatives powers to use lethal force for things which they themselves cannot use lethal force for. No. So therefore, that's why, it's, that's why the system is collapsing. It's a, it's a fiction. The government or the state just assumes it has the power to do these things because the majority voted for them. But Mm. uh, it doesn't work that way. So now I kind of back to the beginning of of, of this argument here. What is it we want government to do? And um, if we're smart and we think that we want to remain free in the state and in the state that we're living in, we better be very clear about limiting the power of the state 
and very clear as to what it shall not be used for. Well, you know, when you take a look at the American Constitution with our Bill of Rights, that was the first time that I'm aware of in history that this idea that I'm just expressing was ever put into a political uh, entity, a, a political mm -hmm. mechanism. Because it was saying, the, the, think of the Ten Amendments. Uh, Congress shall pass no law to abridge the rights of freedom of speech, peaceful assemble, the right to bear arms. Now, they say Congress shall pass no law. That means the Congress, who rep which represents the people, they're saying the majority shall pass no law. Hmm. <laughs> the majority, uh, they can't take away your right to bear arms or to speak out freely or any of these things. Oh, and not this one either. It's a whole list of things that they were trying to make it clear that the state that they were creating could not do. Now, if they had just said they can't do anything except the defense of life and liberty, that would have got covered the whole thing a lot better and a lot more clear. But it was a, a beta model, mind you. And so these individual freedoms and liberties were in people's minds when they were writing the Constitution. So they took it from the other side. They said, we'll list the exceptions rather than the general rule. If we ever have a chance to create another constitution or input to it, the old one, I would strongly recommend we change that and, and start from the other side and say, the state shall do the use its powers for anything, shall not use for anything except the defense of life and liberty. And the rest is up to the individuals in freedom and privacy to do as they wish. Yeah, I like that. I one of the things that kind of comes to mind is COVID in 2020. I, it seems like that was one of the that was probably the biggest co biggest collectivist push I've seen in recent history, where people were told constantly that they need to put their individualism on the back burner and prioritize the collective, prioritize the majority. And I, I really like what you had to say about what we're allowing the state to do when we're when we give them power to govern because we are giving them a right to use or we are giving them the power to use death like they can kill people with the power of the state and it reminds me of i i had some friends that were pushing more of the collectivist ideas uh during 2020 and one of them was about masks and i said i don't care if you want to wear a mask i think that's fine but if you support mask mandates, you actually support a police state too. Because what a mandate is, is it's saying you have to do this. And if you don't do it, we're authorizing the state to come in and force you to do it. So if someone's not wearing a mask, a, a police officer can start a conversation with somebody and potentially arrest them. It can escalate. Somebody can die. And ironically, we were going through... Uh, the Black Lives Matter protests around the same time. So I, I find it interesting uh, that you pointed out what we're giving the state the ability to do with uh, supposedly protecting our rights. Yeah, and it, your example is a, is a good one because it raises a kind of an anomaly in this whole issue. Uh, if we agree that uh, one, of the, one of the two reasons you can use coercion against citizens is to protect lives, then it could be argued that, well, COVID is a deadly disease, and therefore the state is justified in using coercion to protect your lives and everybody else's by requiring these infected ones to uh, be quarantined or whatever. Uh, quarantine is what they would, or to be vaccinated or whatever it is, you know. Yeah. But now, how do we resolve that one? Because I would say yes, if it could be proven that that is true. But the problem here is that politicians and their and their underlings lie about it. Now, they said it was for our protection to, to protect our lives. And we believed it because they said it. Now, the fact is, I think you know, and I certainly know that this was a lie. It's definitely mm -hmm. a lie. And they knew it was a lie from the beginning. Now, there's the crime. The, the principle is firm, but the, the rest of the principle is that everything has to be transparent. And I think that in, in a proper state, if, if, we, if we could say that it's 
it's okay to use coercion to protect lives and liberty, then if they pretend to be protecting lives and are lying about it and it's part of a criminal intent, now they have committed a crime against that very principle. And mm-hmm. now that the state is justified to justly punish a person who is using this excuse and, and, and lying about the facts and so forth. And they can lie about anything. And say, you know, we're going to be attacked by another country any day now, so we better attack them first. And you can whip that up. and Oh, yeah, that's going to happen. But what if it's a lie? What if it's just an excuse to get into the war? What if it's like a Pearl Harbor? And uh, what, if, if, what if our own leaders, as was in the case in Pearl Harbor, knew the Japanese were going to attack? In fact, they did everything they could to encourage them to attack so we could respond as being a victim and get into World War II so that we could be at the peace table at the end. Blah. I think most people know that story now, that Washington, D.C. knew full well that the attack was coming from Japan, and they had engineered it, actually. And they, they tried to burn all the records that proved it, but some of them still remained. And now they've discovered documents that show, yeah, this was a carefully orchestrated plan in Washington, D.C., under the, uh, under the uh, uh, direction of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and, and the Council on Foreign Relations members in his cabinet at the time. And uh, after, I mean, people would would probably be willing to kill you if you said, well, that was a, a planned attack and, and President Roosevelt had a lot to do with it. People would say, what are you, a traitor or something? They would have killed you for saying such a thing. But now it's a matter of historic record. It's all yeah. there. And and I think it was Titinius who was uh, in, in um, Roosevelt's cabinet r- wrote his diaries that were published many years later. And you can read it right in his diaries. He says, that, that was a wonderful act of statesmanship that, President Roosevelt did, sacrificing and having the death of 4,000 U.S. sailors at Pearl Harbor. That was a wonderful act of statesmanship, he said, because it allowed us to get into the war at an earlier date, and it was for the greater good for the greater number. For it was greater, it was a greater thing for America that we got in early in the war than later in the war. So there you are, right back to collectivism. You can do anything, anything at all provided you just claim that it's for the greater good of the greater number. But now what do you do about people who lie about it? You better be sure that your penalties for lying about those excuses are severe. I mean, very severe so that people won't even think about doing it. It's not because the principle is bad. It's because people are allowed to get away with lying about it. That's our problem. Yeah. When you talk about what the state is able to do and what we're, what we're giving them permission to do and, what we're giving them permission to use. It's interesting because in my head, I'm like, well, I I think you can actually, if you're disingenuous, you can actually make a roundabout argument that you're protecting life and liberty for all these different things. And that's what the collectivists tend to do is they they tend to say, well, we're protecting lies by doing this, if they even make an argument. Because often there is, uh, I I like language and uh, I like to, try to be pretty specific with what I'm saying and understand what people are trying to say. And often you'll hear we're fighting for rights, but there's no right ever defined. It's just, we're fighting for rights and they'll use the word rights without ever actually clarifying what right they're pursuing. Well, of course that's, that's nice. And if you pursue it, they'll say, Oh, well, I have a right to a job. No, you don't have a right to a job. Can you go to your neighbor next door and force him to hire you or shoot him if he doesn't? You don't have the right to use coercion for a job. And so therefore you can't delegate to the government the power to force somebody to hire you or pay you a certain fee or anything. If you can't do it with your neighbor, then the government can't do it either. Mm. So one thing that comes to mind is uh, there's been a push for universal basic income. And stuff like that, where people can essentially get money for just living. And it seems like a collectivist argument can be made that that is protecting a right of life. Because if you can't, if you don't have any money, you can't survive, right? So what would you, what would you respond to that with? Well, I would say that maybe some of these collectivists aren't lying about it because they probably really believe it. But usually you find those same collectivists who d- 
who are, make that argument, they could be working for, let's say, the, uh, um, the Forestry Service. And they would, with great enthusiasm, put up signs, do not feed the wild animals. Hmm. Why? Because that hurts them. Then they forget how to forage for themselves. So they, they understand the reality uh, when it comes to, to nature. But when it comes to themselves, they're blind because their positions, their authority, their paychecks, uh, everything depend on them being wrong. So, and besides, it's easy if you don't challenge these things facts. I, I mentioned earlier, I fell for almost all of this when I was young. It all sounded so good to me. And they try very hard not to encourage us to think deeply on these things. So, because once you start, I don't care what your belief system is. In fact, some of the people who are ca causing the greatest havoc, I think, in our system, because they are collectivists, really believe that they are doing the best thing. And they really believe this. And I have, my experience has been, if you can talk to people like that and without them becoming very angry because you're challenging, they sense that you're challenging their belief system. It's hard, hard for all of us actually to, to be calm under those conditions. But anyway, it, I have an opportunity to talk heart to heart with a lot of young people who are, they consider themselves collectivists or neo-communists or whatever they want to call themselves because they really believe that what we're talking about, they believe these slogans. Once you peel back the, the uh, skin of the argument and see what lies beneath it, these, these guys and gals are the strongest supporters of individualism you'll ever imagine because their passion is there. It's just they suddenly realized that they were tricked and they were working to achieve, they didn't know it, but to achieve just the opposite of what they thought they were trying to bring to pass. I tend to agree with you. I think people that have collectivist tendencies tend to not, I, I think a lot of them think that they're pursuing the good. I think that many of them do think that they're, it's it's not like, oh, no, individualists are bad and I'm, I just, I'm against individualists. I think many of them do believe that their that their belief system is well meaning. I, I, I think oh, yeah. I mean I think most people to do anything bad, most people have to first believe that what they're doing is good or, or you know, I think Solzhenitsyn wrote something like that. Uh most people have to believe it's part of the greater good or at least uh in line with human nature or something. I, I'm messing up the quote, but I do tend to believe that collectivists are well-meaning, except some aren't. And it, it's <laughs> yeah. usually the people that are higher up on the food chain in the political circles. I think many of those people are very disingenuous. Either, either they don't believe what they're saying or they're maybe too stupid to realize that they're not, uh, they're not living what they're saying. Um, because it, it seems like a lot of collectivists are just parroting, and uh, this is politics in general. A lot of people are just parroting what they've heard. They're they're not actually thinking through what they're saying, and uh, you have to really get into a conversation with people like that before they realize, oh, okay, yeah, they're maybe maybe what I'm saying isn't something I completely believe, but. Like you said, it's it's hard to have conversations where you're challenging somebody's beliefs. A lot of people are not open to that. So, how right. do you how do you have that conversation with somebody? Well, uh, sometimes you can't, and uh, that's sad. But usually you can. I think it depends a lot on how we approach it. Um, first of all, I, I I need to repeat this again. I'm I do not think that I am any smarter than the average person. I don't think that. I, I have any great endowment that I was able to figure out all these things and all those other unwashed masses haven't been able to figure it out. None of that. I was just lucky that I came across some good information early on. I had a couple of role models that uh, attracted my attention and I thought I would pursue them a little bit and see what they were all about. And I liked what I discovered as I got into the terrain it, but it could have been the other way around because I, I can go back, crank myself back historically back to high school and early college. Even even after I was out of college, I remember having coffee 
once with a bunch of the fellow employees. We were uh, talking about social security and how, and the retirement benefits and inheritance taxes finally came up. And somebody suggested who, in fact, it was, I think it was the head of our department suggested that it was a terrible thing to um, allow people to inherit money that they didn't earn because that was not merit, meritocracy at all. That was just a, uh, an act of uh, fortune. That why should mm-hmm. this person have so much money just because their father or their grandfather had a lot of money and passed it down? Uh, we ought to have a law that takes away all all inheritances. So everybody has a fresh start and an equal start, you know? I thought, yeah, that sounds fair. <laughs> Until I got to thinking through it later. So I was all on board. I mean, I was ready to go. I talk, talk about a collectivist idea. That is it, you know? And, but it made sense to me at the time. So uh, I, I don't, I have to be careful and answer your question. When you're talking to somebody who's still stuck in the, those ruts like I was, remember, they're, they're very sensitive. They don't want you to say, hey, dummy, why aren't you smart like me? And a lot of us tend to do that in our attitude in some way or another. And that's not it at all. So I think the first step is to remember that you deserve to be humble in in this discussion and keep an open mind. Sometimes these people will come up with something that um, will stump you. Like I just remembered you asked a question or brought up an issue before that I was working toward dealing with and I never got there. And you said, is there anything that... I have trouble with. And I said, yes. And then I got off on this other thing about delegating only those powers that you have. And I forgot where, why I was down that path. And so I come back and allow me to do that. Now, uh, yeah. this business of, uh, of uh, telling people, you know, what color they have to paint their house or how, how large a house, it, it can't be any larger than a certain size, or they can't put a gas station on this street because this is a a community and so forth. I keep thinking, well, I can't tell my neighbor that he can't can't put a gas pump in his front yard. I don't have it. What right do I have to tell him that he can't put a gas station next to my house? But my instinct says, I don't want anybody putting a gas station next to my house. So there's my conflict, you see. And yet I know that in principle, in principle, if I, can't force my neighbor to take down that gas pump, then I can't vote that power to the state either. Hmm. So there, there is a potential answer, but it's not a pleasant one because it means, it means that we're probably going to wind up having to put up with some things in our neighbor's yard that we don't like <laughs> in order yeah. to retain the right to do the same for ourselves, which someday we'll wish we had that right. And if we deny it to the guy next door, then we're also denying it to us as well. Earlier, you mentioned uh, consent of the governed. And the thought popped into my head when you mentioned that. Does the, does the government have our consent at this point in time? Because you can look at presidential elections and we'll talk about who gets what percentage of the vote, but that's just a percentage of the vote. Like there's 30%, 40%. I don't know what the number is, but there's a large percentage of the population that doesn't vote at all. And you can see this down the ballot. You can see this in uh, federal elections for Congress. You can see this in state elections. So even the person that gets, if they get 60% of the vote, that ends up being... 40% of the population that voted or 40% of the population that could have voted that has the ability to vote. So does the government have our consent at this point in your opinion? Well, I could see a a really good court case coming up on that. And uh, I I'd love to sit and listen to the arguments pro and con. Um, And I think it, uh, in so many cases, the answer is, to questions like that depends not on what we think the words mean, like consent. We think that means our voluntary consent on an active day-to-day action-by-action basis. But in the courtroom, I think you would find that the word consent means 
Has it been done in writing, duly authorized, or duly notarized? And it, does it mean that the person consenting has had full access to information about that to which he is consenting? And you get into all of these arguments, legal arguments, that color the word consent. Mm. So if you're dealing with a legal issue, like a constitutional issue of human rights, I think the word is a lot more restricted than just, I, I agree to give you my uh, um, uh, my wristwatch in return for your book or something like that, you know? Yeah. Well, and also the the idea I gave of voting, that doesn't really... I mean, you already mentioned people are often voting for the lesser of two evils. They're voting against somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think you can call that consent either. No, so if, no, if you're not. voting for one person because you don't like another person, I don't think that really means you consent, that you approve of the other person it just means you dislike the other more. So yeah, consent is a sticky word there. Yeah. When it comes to the Federal Reserve, I would love for you to kind of expand on why the Federal Reserve is such a problem and why maybe people who are more favorable to socialism and communism, what they're missing in not taking into consideration what the Federal Reserve System actually is. Because a lot of people want to say, well, in our current capitalist society, this is the way it is. But are we even under capitalism right now? <laughs> well, we're back to words again. Always, always yeah, we get yeah, back of course. to words again. <laughs> capitalism. What is capitalism? The dictionary has a definition that it's, a, it's an economic system in which the uh, property and the means of production is owned by private individuals or something like that. And um, well, what does the word owned mean? Yeah. <laughs> and what is private mean? You have to suffer over every, every one of these words. But in general, people think of the word capitalism as being the opposite of uh, socialism. It's often used that way because I think Karl Marx probably used the word capitalist and socialist more in one book than anybody else. So you come out of that thinking, well, these are the extremes. These are the opposites. They're not opposites at all, like everything else, you know. Um, the, um, pe the people say that um, they like to use the word crony capitalism. They say we're living under a, a condition today of crony capitalism. And what it really is, no, it's crony socialism that we're living under, if mm -hmm. you want to use the words at all like that. Uh, it's crony, all right. But we haven't seen any uh, signs of life in capitalism in America, probably in uh, at least 100 years or 80 years or something like that. Um, to say that we are living under capitalism today is, is a complete delusion, my friends. That uh, true capitalism hasn't existed for a long, long time. And even before then, it was kind of a mixture, a blend of private ownership of property and the means of production and, and government ownership of um, property and the means of production. And then even you get to this in intermediary form where institutional ownership of property and the means of production. Is that private or is it government? Well, it's sort of neither. So you, we had to add a third category, institutional, big insurance companies, big corporations, and so forth. They're certainly not individuals in the strict sense of the word. Anyway, so you get, you're back to words again. This is why the, le the legal system is so critical in, um, and people don't think much about it. They just think it's a place where you go to resolve arguments and conflicts. But you go there to define what these words mean, and they make a big, big difference on your life and your freedom and your, um, your, your quality of life. So I don't know where I'm going that, with that again. I sort of wander around. Um, but capitalism, what is it? And are we living under it? And the answer is, whatever it is, we're not living under it today. And I don't even like the word anymore because it, it's not precise enough. I come back to my mantra. Individualism versus collectivism is what we should be talking about. That answers all these questions. And once we get off on these worn other phrases, worn out phrases that really don't mean anything clearly, except what you 
think or feel that they mean. Right. Uh, we, I'm a capitalist. The people think anybody with a lot of money is a capitalist. That's what their definition. That's not the definition of money. I mean, the people who control the largest amounts of money are the socialists, the collectivists, the the rulers of the collectivist state. I mean, you go to any communist country and you see the peasants out there, they're pushing brooms on the street, washing down the bricks and so forth. But who's riding around in the limousines and living in the big mansions, just like the royalty did before the revolution? These are the commissars. And don't tell me that that communism is a classless society. It's one of the most class-laden societies you've ever seen in the world. So all of these words, you, you get twisted. They call this capitalism today in, in the United States. No, it's not. It's collectivism. And it's, it's uh, not even socialism anymore. It's collectivism. Let's call it what it really is. So um, I guess that's my answer to the question, whatever the question was. <laughs> no, I like that. Actually, I think you you handled that question really well because one of the things that I've noticed, I, I have a friend who is, uh, he looks upon socialism and communism very favorably. And he told me that, and actually, when I rewatched the interview with Yuri Bezmenov, he calls uh, the Soviet Union state capitalism. And my friend called it state capitalism, too. And it's wordplay. It, it 100% is wordplay. It, there's this politics, tendency. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's this tendency for people who support communism and socialism to define it so narrowly that it has never even been tried and capitalism so broadly that anything going on anywhere is capitalism, which I just, it is, it all comes down to wordplay. So I, I really liked your answer because I, I do think it's collectivism versus individualism over anything because you can look at that. There's no way that you can look at the Soviet Union and say that was anything but collectivism. Right. Absolutely. So it, it clears it clears the deck and allows you to get down to the nitty gritties of the principles underneath it. Any of these other words need to be defined and redefined. And then you find people who will not agree with your definition, some who do agree and some who do not agree and so forth. But when it comes to collectivism and individualism, I don't think anyone disagrees with the definition uh, they're either, they either say, well, that's right, I like it, or that's right, I don't like it. And I find that most people, when they really see what it stands for, they don't like it. They don't like collectivism. That They come to the conclusion and say, how about that? I guess I'm an individualist. I didn't know that. You know, this is kind of the awakening we all come to. Could you define collectivism so people know exactly what we're talking about? Well, yes, I think I can. I think. This this little book, The Chasm, probably defines it, but uh, it's you don't want 50 pages to define it. I, I guess you would say, let's see if I, I can do this. Collectivism is a, a political ideology based on the principle that the state represents the power and the will of the people and has unlimited authority to use whatever, to apply whatever measures it sees fit to advance any program that is deemed to be in the benefit of the greater number of the greater, of the majority of the people. Something like that. That, that would be the essence of it, I think. The idea that the state is all beneficent uh, all good, all knowing, you know, like, in fact, this is interesting when I think about it. Most of the original thinkers who advanced the principles of socialism, communism, fascism, and Nazism, I might add, all of those people, at some point or another, refer to the state as a replacement for God. Hmm a replacement for religion at least, maybe not God, but for religion, which is why all of these collectivist groups or ideologies or variants of collectivism are enemies of uh, religion. They, are, they attack any religion. It's not just one religion, any religion. 
and the family unit as well, because those are the two institutions that people can turn to for help and support in times of need. And the state doesn't like that. They want that to be the only source. If you have a problem, you go to the state and they will take care of it. They don't go to your pastor or your priest. You don't go to your grandmother or your grandfather or your parents. You come to the state and you fill out the form and get in line. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I've pointed out to people that even if you're not religious, your right to determine your own religion is probably the most important right that you have. I mean, that is the the basics of freedom of expression. Uh, that That is your First Amendment right. Because if, if you can't decide what religion you are or uh, what God you worship, then you're basically giving away your right to the state for your, the state to decide what you put as the top priority in your life. Yeah, that's why they, they all say that the state should, be, should replace uh, religion and the family. That those yeah. two go together for the same reason. With the, with the word play, and uh, I agree with you completely, because as much as we want to have a conversation, we're using words and the words can be sticky and they can be defined differently. And you have to make sure that you're, you're speaking the same language as the person you're talking to. And uh, I find one of the funniest examples of wordplay is the word fascism, actually, because I don't know, 10 years or so ago, I, uh, I was reading and I started to notice that the word fascism would often be tied to the word right wing or the term right wing. Uh, that's how people would define it. And I find it humorous because it's like, wait, so you're telling me if you can have all of these qualities of fascism, but if you're on the left, you're excluded from being considered a fascist. That's really convenient for all the people on the left, isn't it? Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. (laughs) And of course it's all the same. The principles are the same. I, I've I've, uh, studied the works of, uh, of Marx, of course, and Lenin, and Adolf Hitler. Mein Kampf is a is a tremendous book to read. I I urge you, now don't quote misquote me. I urge you to read Mein Kampf not because I like what's in there, but because you need to know how these people think. Yeah. I can just see some newspaper reporter saying, "Oh, Ed Griffin said you should read Mein Kampf." <laughs> and, uh, that's the end of this quote. And okay, there goes Griffin. <laughs> but Mussolini, Mussolini had some pretty good things to say about this too. Um, you know, the word fascist, I believe, comes from the, it's probably Italian, meaning fascisti or something, meaning a, a bunch of straws or, or sticks in a bundle. Any one little stick is weak. You can break it. But if you put 50 of them in a bundle and tie the bundle, that's the fascisti. It's strong. You can't break it. It's, it's, uh, so the idea of, Many being united as strongly close together was strength. That was what Mussolini talked about. Well, Hitler did the same thing. He didn't use the word fascist. He just used the word um, Nazi, which Nazi was the abbreviation for the German word for National Socialist Party, believe it or not. So the Nazis are socialists, too. They're all the same. Once you really dig underneath the skin and see what lies underneath all of that, they're all the same. Yeah, with Hitler specifically, I think some people might make the argument that he was using the word socialism to essentially trick people into believing that there was a socialist element to it. Uh, I've heard arguments for that, but he chose to put that word in there for a reason. So I think it definitely has. Well, that's, to that's not what he, that's not what he says in his own writings. Hmm. He, he was as far as. My interpretation it was that he was a he was an advocate, and uh, that's uh, where the communists and the Nazis not only came together on a common ground, but also were a very belligerent opponents because they were struggling for dominance. Mm-hmm. Each one said, "I know more about socialism than you do, and your socialism is not as good as our socialism," and so forth. It was kind of petty in many cases. But no, I, I'm sorry to say to your friends that uh, Adolf was a definite socialist and um, he spoke about socialism in a very endearing manner. Hmm. 
He was against communism, which I find interesting because I've always felt like communism is essentially the natural evolution of socialism. Like, because if, if you, if you see socialism as the people owning the means of production, well, the only way that you can actually make that happen is by giving the state the power to give them the ability to own the means of production. So it ends up being communism anyway, doesn't it? Well, here we are with words again. <laughs> Back to the words. Of course. What's the difference between communism and socialism? Um, Marx answered that question. He wrote eloquently about it. His answer was that um, socialism is the system we are building. And that's why they call it the Soviet Socialist Republic, not the Soviet Communist Republic. Mm -hmm. Because Marx said, we will come to power and establish socialism. Then, after many generations, where we eliminate all of the remnants of opposition, and the, we have removed the, the, um, the, the impulse for greed and, and um, privatization from the human brain, then society will no longer need the state to regulate it because everybody will cooperate with each other in loving peace and harmony. And then, and only then, will we have communism. Now, this is Karl Marx speaking. So you're right in a sense that communism would be the extension of socialism in Karl Marx's mind. Mm. But that's not how m most of the socialists and the communists uh, just think of it. I don't, unfortunately, I think most of the socialists and communists have never read Karl Marx. Mm. Or, and the, the um, yeah, the, the uh, socialists and communists have never read Karl Marx. Or if they did, they didn't know what they were reading and soon forgot what this he was saying. So the truth is that there's never been a communist country in existence ever, according to Marx. It's never existed. It was always that utopian future that would come someday when humanity would have been changed in his heart and his mind and there would be no competition and no greed. And then, then we would have wonderful communism. Now, what does that leave us to talk about? Uh, it's collectivism. <laughs> that's, what we're, yeah. that's what we're, in both cases, it's collectivism. Well, that, that idea of a utopia is used quite a bit. And it's very alluring. Like, oh, if yeah. you, I yeah. mean, who doesn't want to be in a utopia? But a utopia is not even somewhat possible it's a complete it's a fiction i think we lived in a utopia hmm. i think the last hundred years or skip the last 50 years but that hundred years before that was a utopia as far as civilization was concerned people wanted to come to america from everywhere we, Im immigrants were coming from everywhere they wanted to get into the utopia we had hmm. it i could see that i can i can definitely understand that um I think when yeah you and this is back to wordplay a bit, but you said we're living under socialism right now, and, and people that view socialism favorably would scoff at that. I'd imagine they'd say, "No, we're not. This is not socialism." Could you elaborate on that a little bit of why you believe that what we are under is closer to socialism than anything else? Well, sure. And what I if I said we're living under socialism, I probably was deliberately choosing the more common word just so that I didn't have to go yeah. and explain the difference between <laughs> collectivism and individualism again. But if I use the word, we're living under socialism, I probably would want to uh, write an addendum and say, no, change that to collectivism. Okay. And now, okay, we are living under collectivism, and most people would call it socialism if you use the common definition Gotcha. And there's no common definition, but there's a sort of a general acceptance of the idea that the state, they sometimes call it the nanny state, is going to take care of you. You, you, uh, you cooperate with what the state wants you to do, and the state will take care of you. And that's it. That's sort of the general uh, gum-chewing public's understanding of socialism. How wonderful it is because the state will take care of your 
your medical care, your job, your uh, now they're going to give you money even if you don't have a job, and take care of your housing, they give you transportation, they provide for your education, they give coupons for your food and your clothing. That's what they would call the utopia. Of course, they don't complete the picture and realize that in order to get all those things, you have to be perfectly obedient to the state and you have to stand in long lines and you have to fight your way up the uh, the class struggle. The guys at the bottom don't have nearly the same coupons that the guys at the top do and so forth. <laughs> and uh, yeah. they leave that part out. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, we're living under collectivism and um, there's very little in our lives today that is not government regulated. It, can you think of anything? And take a look at the Bill of Rights. There's only one left. The only one left right now in the Bill of Rights, really, is the right to bear arms. And they're working on that. Yeah. Uh, the rest have all been taken away by COVID. Okay. I, I can definitely undersee, understand where you're coming from there. Uh, with the Federal Reserve System, I would, I would love for you to expand on that a bit because why, why do we have it? Why? I mean, at this point, it was established, what, 1913? And uh, we've had it for basically anyone who's alive today has lived under the Federal Reserve System in the U.S. their entire lives. They've never known anything different, but it's not the first central bank that we've had. Um, it distorts, first of all, what is money? Money is just a medium of exchange, right? Anything mm -hmm. can be money. That's all it is. Um, yeah. We can use so the gold. question we, is what is the Federal Reserve System? Uh, yeah. So what is the Federal Reserve System? Why is it what it is, and why why is it so important to understand? I'll take a moment to collect my thoughts on that because there are a couple of ways to approach that and they'd all be valid but we don't have time for all of them um well just start with the basics you don't have to get too deep to see what it is and where the problem lies but the deeper you go the more you realize oh it's even worse than i thought <laughs> but so let's stay on the surface a little bit what is it well the federal reserve system is called a central bank that's the official language used for it that doesn't tell us anything it's still what is a central bank well, in the case of the Federal Reserve, it's a group of banks that have formed, come together like a labor union or like an uh, economic uh, association, like the Milk, the milk Association or the uh, Plumbers Association or the AMA, the Doctors Association. It's a group of of entrepreneurs, in this case, banks in a certain industry that have come together for their own mutual benefit, okay? Now, there's a word for that, and it's called a cartel. So when you really look into this, you find out that the Federal Reserve System is not, not a government agency at all, although it appears to be, and they went to great lengths back in 1910 when they first met on Jekyll Island to put this whole thing together. And you're right, by the way, 1913 was the date at which it was finally passed into law. But they started to work on it in 1910 in secret on Jekyll Island. And the reason for the secrecy is they didn't want the truth to seep out, let people know what the Federal Reserve really was. And they still, for the most part, still don't know what it is. They think it's a government agency like the military, you know, they think, well, it's part of the U.S. government. And it, uh, it manages our money uh, for our own good and all that stuff. But okay, back to the, to the uh, idea line here. It's not a federal agency at all. It's a private corporation. It was chartered by Congress, but it's a private corporation. And <clears throat> just the way states charter corporations, the federal government can charter a corporation too, and it did. And so this is a federal charter. And um, so being a charter and passed into law back in 1910, then everything in the charter becomes law. So what we find out 
in the, back away a little bit further, we find out that the banks came together, all the former competitors, they decided not to compete with each other anymore. They're going to all unite and come up with the same common practices and rates and so forth so they can benefit without having to be competitive. Or they would compete with lesser issues, you know, they have special programs and so forth. But they, their rates are all essentially the same. Mm-hmm. Their business practices are all essentially the same. So you have no place to go because there are no, you can't be a bank unless you're really a member of the Federal Reserve System. Can't be a big bank and functioning very well. So what we have, therefore, is a cartel of banks, not a, not a, not a, um, a coal cartel or a banana cartel. It's a banking cartel. And they wrote a cartel agreement to their advantage in every respect as to policies and competition and everything. And they sent that to Congress. And if you can put in your mind mentally, they took a big eraser and erased the top of the page where it said cartel agreement among us banks. And they wrote in Federal Reserve Act. And they gave it to the idiot politicians who thought it was a good idea or were convinced it was a good idea. And they passed it into law. So that means that today you and I have to do, we have to obey, we have to do everything that's in the Federal Federal Reserve Charter, the Federal Reserve Act, or we go to prison, which is why most people think it's a government agency, because only the government can put you in prison, right? Wrong. If you're um, a private institution and you can go to Congress, and because of your financial influence, you can get Congress to pass your 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 criminality into law, well, then you have just become a private institution that has the power of law. Now, that's basically what the Federal Reserve is, is a cartel that's working for the best interests of the cartel. Now, it always says it's working for the best interest of the consumer, you. It's trying to protect the purchasing power of the dollar, trying to keep the in the economy flourishing. It's for our own good, you understand. But if you understand the nature of a cartel, cartels have only one purpose, and that is to promote the, uh, to promote the purposes and the goals of the members of the cartel, period. So that's what we got, a ca- private cartel posing as a government agency and getting away with it. And now what are they doing? They got Congress to give it the power to create the nation's money supply. Hmm. Now, that, by the way, uh, my reading of the history of part of that is that when they went to Congress in 1913, they didn't really expect Congress to go for giving them the power, the private banks, the power to issue the government's money, the nation's money. They thought it would be all bank money, bank notes. But all of a sudden, no, they're going to put the United States of America on top of these bills. And they were flabbergasted that Woodrow Wilson came on board with that. And and everybody seemed, okay, I guess it's a good idea. We are the United States, I suppose. They're completely oblivious to banking principles or money, uh, how money works. Anyway, they voted, they gave this cartel the right to issue our national money and gave them the total right to do it. Congress has no oversight over it whatsoever. Congress can call hearings all it wants to, and it does. It quite often has hearings, and the Federal Reserve chairman goes to the to the boardroom, and they sit there, and the, the, the uh, congressmen and the senators ask questions, and they're very stern. Well, Mr. Chairman of the Federal Reserve, why did you do this, and why did you do that? And anybody watching it on television, they think, oh, these, these guys in Congress are really looking out for us, aren't they? Asking these tough questions. But when it's all over, it's all over. I mean, Congress has no authority over what the Federal Reserve does to the money supply. That's it. The only authority they have is to abolish the Fed. They created the Fed, or they could probably rework the federal charter a little bit and change the provisions, but they have to do that first. And in order to do that, they've got to go through Congress. Congress is very susceptible to the influence of the Federal Reserve, the tremendous money power. It's never going to happen that way. So we have a situation. Now I'm going to summarize this. this. This is the short version, believe it or not. Because of this power, this out, 
outrageous relationship that was created. People think that the government controls the Federal Reserve System, but in reality, the Federal Reserve System controls the government. Would, well, first of all, I have to say it's laughable <laughs> the, uh, protecting the value of the dollar, that goal of theirs is laughable because the value of the dollar has only gone down since the Federal Reserve was enacted. Mm -hmm. uh, with the best evidence that it's not government controlled, that it's not part of the U.S. government, wouldn't the fact that there's national debt be the best evidence of that? Because if it were the federal government, the federal government wouldn't be able to hold a debt to itself, right? Of course not, no. That, so that, there, there's proof right there that, uh, that they are separate entry, ent entities. The government and the Federal Reserve are not the same. Yeah. The, the Federal Reserve loans money to the government, and the government pays interest on that loan to the Federal Reserve. So you're quite right. If, they were the, if it was a government agency, it would just, they might keep two ledgers, but it wouldn't mean anything. Well, yeah. it doesn't mean too much now because nobody really expects the government to pay it back. That's part of the fraud. Everybody, not everybody, but most people in Congress know that. Anybody in the world of finance knows that the debt that is so huge now will never and can never be repaid. So it's a fiction. It's a myth. It's, we're just living out the final days before the final thing just turns to dust and we're left holding the dust particles and the dustpan. For those that are look at socialism and communism more favorably and they just, everything in our current system is evil capitalism, could you explain why they should take a deeper look at what the Federal Reserve System actually does to the economy? Well, yes, uh, th that's a really good question because where's the connection? Um, all of the things that governments do to promote collectivism and expand its, its impact and its uh, operational efficiency within a nation, all of the things that governments have to do to promote and and institute collectivism at a higher level takes a lot of money. And if the government doesn't have the money, we cannot have collectivism unless the government taxes it from the people directly, hmm. which it has been known to do. <laughs> Historically, uh, governments are known to tax their people. But also there seems to be a, um, a parallel historical factor there, and that is when these governments tax their people beyond a certain level, and I think from my observation, it seems to be about 40% of their productivity. If people have to pay more than, say, 38, 40% of their productivity to the government, usually what happens is there's a tax revolt mm -hmm. and a rebellion or a revolution. And uh, like we had here in the United States, it was over taxes to a large extent. And, um, and so governments have always been ha very cautious about going too far. And you cannot have collectivism unless the government is paying for this, 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 and that too. That's how it works. And so you can't get it from taxes. Where are you going to get it? Well, you have to borrow it. Who's going to lend it to you if they don't think you're ever going to repay it? Well, why don't you just become partners with a private banking institution and you create something called the central bank or, in our case, the Federal Reserve System. And now we'll go through the motions, even though we're, it's a partnership, literally, even though it's really joined at the hip. It appears like two separate organizations and functions that way. So we can go through the charade of the Federal Reserve creating money to buy government bonds. Government bonds that the government couldn't sell to the public unless they raise the interest rates a lot higher. So the deal that they strike is, well, we'll, we'll give you government bonds at a, a relatively low interest rate, and you give us, you create the money 
and give us the money. Now, that's the same thing as if the government did it themselves. But by dividing the action between two structures, what appears to be this government, and what appears to be the Federal Reserve System, it's very confusing to the average person and it's even confusing to the experts a lot of the times. And it's, it's easy to lose fact of what's actually happening. And you think it's a real transaction, like a legitimate economic transaction where there's a loan made and the loan has to be repaid plus interest. It's none of that. It's just that they keep creating more and more of it and they make more IOUs, which they know are never going to be repaid. And so the money supply keeps inflating and inflating and inflating. And we have this ugly thing called inflation because we're creating money like, like all get out. There's no, there's no tomorrow and no reason not to from their point of view. So back to the question, why is this not a good idea for the average person? It's because it's destroying their lives, their futures. They're eating up their savings. The average person today, even before the total collapse, is having to deal with a lower standard of living each year slightly. And now for quite some time, we have had to have two breadwinners in a family. And now we're going to have to have guaranteed annual income to make up the difference and all this. They keep plugging it up and creating the image of prosperity. And it's a mirage. It's a house of cards, I guess, is probably the better analogy. So what's wrong with it? It's going to destroy all of our lives. Our economic existence will be dependent upon the state for everything if we don't stop this, because we'll need to get food. We need shelter, medical care, transportation, employment, money to buy things. Everything will have to come from the state. And we'll have to be obedient to the state if we expect to have any of those benefits. So it's a means of control that's being developed right now. A means of control over you and me and everybody else. If we don't do exactly as we're told and never complain and don't point out any errors or fraudulent activities or criminal activities, just pretend like we don't know we might survive, but we'll be like prisoners in a prison camp, a slave camp. That's why it's bad, because without the Federal Reserve, none of this could happen. One of the political arguments that you're here uh, is that uh, Prices have increased, but wages have remained stagnant for 30 years, whatever it might be. Is the Federal Reserve the reason for that? I'm thinking, I, uh, well, for the Federal Reserve certainly is responsible for the fact that prices have gone up. Yeah. But now, is it responsible for the of wages not going up? Well, I don't, I don't think it's directly responsible. I certainly start with adding that word to it. Um, so, no, I, don't, I think that, but the fact that if the Federal Reserve didn't um, create the inflation in the first place. Uh, oh, and oh, there's something else that just popped into my mind, too. I would say that um, it depends on what class of society you're looking at. I think that the uh, little guy, the working guy, the guy that's supposedly benefiting from all this collectivism, Karl Marx said, you know, workers of the world unite, throw off your chains, and so forth. Is those guys, their wages have not been going up because the corporations determine what their wages are going to be. And uh, they, it's whatever they want it to be. And the corporations are, they don't care. You either work for the wages you've got or you don't. And uh, they're so closely aligned to government that Big corporations now pretty much know they can go anytime they wish to Washington, D.C. and get a bailout. So they don't care. It's no longer, it's no longer a real economic transaction, a transaction to make anything and sell something. It's all politically manipulated and who's got the best deal. It's no longer supply and demand or anything like that. It's no longer a free market, no longer capitalism, as you used the word before. But no, but the guys on the top, the bankers, the corporate executives, the, the guys who are making this happen or who are very pleased with it and are not preventing it from happening, the politicians, for example, their wages are definitely going up. 
and they're riding the crest of the wave. So it's pushing us into a, a deeper class division than ever before. And just as usual, it's doing exactly the opposite of what they say it's supposed to do. I agree with you. I don't think uh, the Federal Reserve makes it so that wages don't get up, go up. It definitely increases the prices. I guess a better way to ask that is, or a better way to, for me to look at it is, Federal Reserve causes inflation. And the only way for wages to keep up with the increased prices are for the people who own the corporations and the businesses to constantly be adjusting their uh, wages, which is just not realistic. So it, it, I don't think the Federal Reserve System creates that discrepancy, but they make it possible. Would that be more accurate? Well... They make it desirable, that's for sure. I guess uh, I'm having trouble with the word possible. Well, uh, like I, if there is, okay, so Federal Reserve System creates inflation. So prices are constantly going up. The people who own the corporations, they have to sit there and say, well, do we increase wages or can we get them to be okay with not increasing the wages? Um so I would say in that sense, it makes it possible for this discrepancy to build up. It makes it possible because if there were no Federal Reserve System and inflation wasn't a problem, if you have those two in whatever alignment they are, prices versus wages, then they're going to basically stay in alignment with no inflation. But with inflation possible, if you don't constantly adjust the, the wages, you're going to have this huge, just huge discrepancy that keeps building and building. Would I be right in that? Yeah, I think, it, yeah, that's basically what I was referring to before, is that that puts a greater divide between the classes now. Yeah. The middle class is getting squeezed out of, of this process. You've got the, the high rollers the, and the, uh, the guys who are struggling to make uh, enough money to put groceries on the table. And that process is continuing and so, yeah, it's it's possible. I think I'll come back to that word for a small company. If the, if there are any of them left, let's say it's somebody down the street that has a. I was going to say a shoe repair store. I haven't seen any of those in a long time. I think they're already squeezed out. You can't even get your shoes repaired anymore. You have to buy a new pair of shoes. Uh, but let's say it's uh, oh, a little small grocery store, and uh, we've got one in town here. Has been around. But I guess they're going to go out of business pretty soon because they're being squeezed out uh, by the big companies. And um, they could raise their prices. It's possible for them to raise their prices, but then they wouldn't be competitive. Uh, I mean, raise their, uh, their prices for labor, for their wages. In other words, that's the price. That's a cost. It's a price of labor. But they could do that. They could do it. But that, then they would have no margin, no profit margin to run their store. So, and they would have to increase their prices and that would put them in a non-competitive position with the big stores and then they go out of business. So I guess two things are happening. Not only is it squeezing out the, the middle class in terms of the consumer, but it's squeezing out the small business guy as well. How is it that, how is it decided who is going to be I guess not decided, but where is the benefit from being close to the printers? It seems like they're the people who are closer to the Federal Reserve System, the large corporations, the heads of those corporations, the big banks, the people who directly benefit when there is a big printing from bailouts and stuff like that. How is it that those people end up in those positions, is it is it just orchestrated so that certain entities and certain groups benefit the most off the Federal Reserve System? That's a good question, and I have to start by saying I really don't know if it's orchestrated. I think um, I think the process of who benefits and who climbs to the top has always been a a, a mystery, somewhat, and you know that you know that it, it depends to a large extent on who you know. Is your family connected? If you come from yeah. the right 
side of town? Do you have a, a degree on the wall from a prestigious university? Uh, do you know somebody who has been a business partner of your uncle? And, you know, we know that that sort of thing plays an important role. Uh, I've seen it the short time I was in the corporate world. I saw that happening. It's who you know is almost as important. In, back in that day, it was almost as important as what you did and how you did it, your meritocracy, in other words. Today, I'm not sure there's much meritocracy left in the equation. It's who you know. And do you travel in the right circles? Do you have the right, do you have the right outlook on the things we're talking about, for example? Are you a collectivist or are you a bloody individualist? You're just going to make trouble for the corporation here. I think those things are probably far more important nowadays than when they were when I was in the corporate world for a short period of time. But in all honesty, uh, I really don't know. That's a good question. I'll have to inquire around and see what the what the other experts, uh, what other people think about that. So the Federal Reserve System, central banking, it, it creates inflation, obviously. It makes war possible, uh, more readily available for governments because instead of asking us for money to fund the wars, they take our future potential money and fund it with that. They, they essentially fund it with our future, future earning potential. Um, what else does the Federal Reserve System create that's negative in the world? Well, I think we pretty well covered it. There's those big categories. They're expanding the money supply and destroying the economy. Now, the economy covers everything. Yeah. Uh, that's everything. I mean, even transactions between members of the same family it has to be done either in passing hard assets one to the other or passing money. And usually it's money. So, um, what else? Uh, well, I wish I uh, had known that question was coming. I would have thought about it. I can, I can see some psychological disadvantages, and that is that uh, because the Federal Reserve exists and because of the propaganda that surrounds it as being a government agency and it's there for our own good, and that these people on the, at the top of it, the board of directors for the Fed and the chairman and the congressman and all these, if we, if we believe what the image is that's presented to us, that all of these people are well-intentioned and doing their best, they're not succeeding, but it's only because these are very dangerous and tricky times, but they're doing the best. And thank God we've got good men like that there. It's that illusion that has been perpetrated and still, I think, sticks to the inside of the skull of most people when they think about their bankers and they think about their politicians, and especially when they think about people with a federal reserve system, it sounds like it's a majestic uh, operation of some kind. It, it, uh, I think that's a, a terrible thing because it, it prevents the average person from being skeptical enough to ask questions. And they're just, they're so trusting. They're so naive. They think that these guys have titles after their names and if they show up in a limousine and if everybody is out towing to them and, and reporters are list, taking every word they say and, and so forth, they think people in positions of high visibility and uh, high authority, they've got to be good because otherwise they wouldn't be at the top like that. And so I think this, your question is, as I'm looking at the answer, is it encourages, it encourages the average person to, to uh, extend and uh, to uh, expand on that myth. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the more that we have in the way of problems that have been created by these people, the more we tend to just go back to the same people and say, well, now what are we going to do about this terrible situation we're in? You're the experts, you know? And um, now that's, I can't actually say that that's a fault of the Federal Reserve as it is a problem with the media. And maybe a problem with our ourselves not being not being inquisitive enough or skeptical enough about important issues like this. Um, 
more I think about it, it's probably more on our own shoulders than anybody else's. But the others take advantage of it quite well. well that brings up a good, uh, good point, which brings me to another question. How does this actually end? Obviously, we're facing a, in the U.S., uh, the Federal Reserve System. They had to uh, refinance their debt not too long ago because the interest is becoming more than uh, they're able to pay. And they have, they're in that position to renegotiate and all that kind of stuff. But eventually it has to come down. The $35 trillion, as it balloons even more and more, eventually they're going to be in a situation where they cannot, they can't keep up with the interest payments alone. And it seems like the, one of the likely scenarios is they're going to do another refinance or go to a CBDCs and, and do something like that and say, oh, we've fixed it. And this new system we've created is going to be better and it's just going to be the same thing and probably more authoritarian than before. But is there another way out? Is I mean, can people opt out by buying Bitcoin or buying gold and just exiting the dollar as quickly as they get it into another potential asset? Like, where do you see this going? What are the possibilities for us as a society to escape this system? It's a hard question because it depends on us to some extent. As I, I believe, I wish I didn't have to say this, but I believe that if the Federal Reserve is not abolished, there's no way out because until that time, it has the authority. It has the law on its side. And we can complain about it all we wish. And we can say, we got to do something and we, this, we should do this and we should take away that. But until we do that, until we actually abolish, I don't think you can reduce the power of the Federal Reserve. You know, it's like a, it's like going to the doctor and, um, he says, well, you've got cancer. It's hard to imagine saying, well, you're not going to take it out, are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about it. Well, what would you replace it with? You know, um, A cancer is deadly. And the Federal Reserve System, this central banking system, is deadly to the economy and to the nation and to our freedom, our personal liberties. So it depends on whether we can marshal sufficient understanding on the part of the public that that can be translated into political pressure in Congress so strong that it'll overpower the economic pressure that the banks are exerting on Congress. It can be done with sufficient understanding with a sufficient number of people, but it's not being done. And we're doing our best right now to, to build the momentum for that. But that would be the first step. So now to answer your question, it depends on we can succeed in getting the Fed abolished. And of course, it won't be that simple. I'm sure when it comes time to write the bill, and I hope somebody's working on it now, there will be some phase out stages or some steps. Because if you just cut the umbilical cord uh, right now, it would, it would, everything would come crashing down. It'd be horrible because we're dependent upon it. That's they count on that. They want us dependent upon it. So it makes us very hesitant to mess around with it because it's easy to see that we could bring the whole house down over our heads if we did that. So anyway, that's the first step. Now, in anticipation of that happening, which I am, I am optimistic enough to say not that it's going to happen, but that it can happen with sufficient effort on our part. If in that case, then what can we do? Well. Whatever we're going to do to ensure our economic and personal freedoms in the future, economic future, we better start with getting rid of the Federal Reserve. And whatever efforts and money we were going to put into the battle, let's put it now to work in that direction. Because if we wait too much longer, it won't make any difference how much money you thought you had left. It'll all be gone. And the time will be too late because there'll be martial law. So, uh, but in the event that we can be on ahead of that, what can we do? Well, some of our 
preparations. Obviously, people talk about this all the time. We we need to be prepared in case they they have some more crises on. Going to have another pan- pandemic. Maybe they're going to have a, 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 a active terrorism. Maybe they're going to have um, uh, maybe the EMP pretended EMP that all the 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 Chinese or the Iranians did that when it, actually they just threw a switch someplace. All the power went out. Oh, the MP it did that. Oh boy, and without electricity in the big cities, you know, think of the pandemonium with no yeah. water, no electricity. People would be killing each other for a drink of water and so forth. You know, these things are all possible. And if you'd say, oh, I don't want to think about those. You don't talk about those things. That's ridiculous. You're doomed, I'm, I'm telling you. So we yeah. need to prepare as best we can for that. But the main thing, uh, my focus is not what we do to survive, although that's important, but how do we Win. What do we do to come out on top on the other side? We're, we're going to have some very hard times ahead. How hard? I don't know, but I'm afraid they're going to be very, very difficult. We should prepare as best we can. I can't give you advice on that. Everybody has their own ideas. Uh, in terms of money, I would say have as much silver coin and gold coin as you can afford to have whatever surplus assets you have. Small denomination might be very useful. As um, as barter, as a form of money, and in case there's no other money system functioning, or only functioning for people who obey and not people who are resisting, so I would recommend that if you want to do that. But the main focus is how do we win this war? I'd like to uh, close that thought. I don't know if I mentioned this last time we were on on the air, but are not. It bears repeating. There's a wonderful uh, documentary film on the life of George Orwell. And it was done by the BBC. And uh, we have it in the archives of the redpilluniversity.org, by the way, if you want to see it. And um, portrayed the life of Orwell. And uh, brilliantly done. The actor was so good, I kept forgetting it wasn't really George Orwell. And in the movie, in the film, the documentary, it said that every word spoken by the actor who was portraying Orwell, every word was actually written by Orwell at some point from his memoirs or been published. So even though it was an actor, we're he- hearing the actual words of Orwell. And um, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what they said. Now, fast forward to the end of the film. Orwell is dying of tuberculosis and he's on his deathbed, I guess. And, uh, He's very weak. And at the foot of the bed is a a woman reporter from, I guess, the BBC. And she's got her notebook out and she's asking him some questions in what appears to be a final final interview. Uh, And he's sitting there in bed gasping for air. And she says, Mr. Orwell, in your book, 1984, you created a very grim picture for the future. What can we do? What can we do about that? How how can we how can we deal with that? And he said he's gasping. He said, "Well, there's only one thing you can do, or we can do, and that is don't let it happen." <laughs> and that's how it closed. And that just stuck to my mind. That is what we should be thinking when we're thinking, what are we going to do about this? The most valuable thing to do is just not to let it happen. And that means the time is now. I mean, like right now to be doing something about it, to turn this whole thing around. So that's my answer. We've got to do everything we can to not let it happen completely and be optimistic enough and powerful enough and strong enough so that when it happens, we'll be able to dig out and build a new world. I think out of the ashes, people will see from the history of the former system, they'll see what went wrong. And especially if we leave in our wake written documentation and videos and commentaries on it, the future will know. And maybe from learning from our mistakes, they'll be able to rebuild it a better future. I like that. 
you uh, you had an interview with Yuri Bezmenov. I believe it was in the 80s. And I think it's a great interview. I think it's prescient to go back and listen to that interview and hear what was said. If you could go back, is there anything that you would ask Yuri looking back on that interview? No, not really. I think we covered the the ground. We'd had conversations off camera uh, that might have been interesting if they were added. But the the I thought what we covered was essential, and that was the important thing. But there were other topics. Hmm. One, for example, I remember I asked uh, Yuri. I said, when you were growing up in the Soviet Union as a young man, before you went into the KGB, um. What was your impression about the people there? Did they actually believe all this communist propaganda? Did they really believe in Marxism? Did they really believe in, I didn't use the word collectivism, but uh, were they sincere? And he said, no, but we pretended Hmm. because we had to. And after a while, as, as I recall, he said, after you pretend long enough, it becomes sort of second nature to you. And you f- even forget that you're pretending. Yeah, there was a, in that interview when he says that the USSR wanted agents that are uh, going on foreign soil, that they wanted them to be married. Because if you're married, then you have something to blackmail the foreign agent with. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. That is dark to think about, but it's Mm -hmm. the level of control that was going on in the Soviet Union and how everyone was afraid of, you had no idea who was going to tell on you for what, even your family members, you can't trust them. That's what COVID started to feel like. That was the atmosphere around COVID when it's like, who's going to tell on you? Who's going to, you have to worry about everyone telling on you in social media or making you look like you don't care about saving lives and all this yeah. stuff. I yeah, think that be, was just a and little beat up, And beat up on you in a public place if you don't have a mask on. Yeah. That's yeah. incredible. So, Mr. Griffin, you're 92, and I, we all have some mental decline as we age. We all, we're never going to be as sharp as we were in our 20s when we're in our 60s and 70s and 80s, and we're all going to have some, you know, we're going to lose some of our sharpness over time, but you're very lucid, you're very with it, you're you're very sharp. And, I, you know, I look at our current uh, commander-in-chief, he's about 10 years younger than you, and uh, can barely, barely form a sentence quite often. Nice. How, I mean, do you have anything that you attribute your longevity to and and your ability to stay sharp even in your later years? Not really. Um, usually people say, what's your secret? You know, I don't have any secrets. Everything I do, I do some things, but there's not secret. Everybody knows about them. Um, they're the kind of things that you know about, but you usually don't do anyway. And I'm sort of in that cate- category. I I know there are a lot of things I should be doing I'm not doing, but some of them I am doing. So for what it's worth, uh, I'll tell you. Um, you know, I went I went through a couple of years ago. I went through something that's called uh, they call it COVID. I don't think it was COVID. I think it was a weaponized version of the flu. But whatever it was, it knocked me down, and I thought I was going to die. Hmm. They had a do not resuscitate bracelet on my arm and everything else when I was in the hospital. But I fought to get out of the hospital. And I'm, I'm glad I did, because if I hadn't, I'm sure I wouldn't be here today. But that's another topic. Um, so I've been, ever since then, I've been short of breath, but that's my major problem now. Uh, and that's improving, but much too slowly. Hmm. So um, it is amazing, because I've not been what you'd call a a super duper health nut uh, all my life. Uh, I, I I was you know about as pop as about as um, um what I'm about as happy with junk food as anybody else of uh, traveling. I love um, 
sweets. I got a sweet tooth. Uh, I would do almost anything for a chocolate covered peanut butter cup, all those things. And uh, so what do I do? I decided a long time ago that I had to keep my body moving. When I was uh, probably about 40 or maybe 38, I got gout. Prior to that, I never thought anything about health because I was a young guy, right? I had no problems. Gout, what is that? Oh, man, that hurt like hell. What is this? I want to get rid of this. So I started to, I think it was, we must have had the internet by then because anyway, I started to research gout. And um, I could, what I found is that nobody knew what, it, what caused it. Well, I said there was uric acid coming out in crystalline form, but why was it coming out in crystalline form? Nobody knew, no, all the official documents had no idea what causes this thing. But we have some drugs you can take and mm -hmm. they won't cure you, but take the drugs anyway. So I went for that a little bit and then the drugs made me sick. So I stopped that and I started to think of all the people I knew in my life and who had gout and who didn't. I knew a few people had gout. And in every case, they were the classic example of the wealthy old timer that sits around in the, in the expensive clubhouse, smoking cigars and drinking a little um, uh, a party now and then. And they're big foot up on the, on, the, on the next chair, all wrapped in cloth. Wealthy old guys had gout and a few old women but no young people had gout, really young, and no old people who were active. I couldn't find any farmers or active uh, workers who were physically working that had gout. So I began to think, hmm, I wonder if there's a connection between that. So I decided that I was going to start to exercise, which I hadn't, hadn't done at that point. And I also landed a little, uh, a little, product that claimed to have um, be good for this sort of thing. It was, just, you know, it, it was just a usual vitamin mineral sort of thing. And I, I took the vitamins and the minerals and that didn't do much good. But then I started to exercise and blow me down about three weeks later. I started, Hey, what happened to my gout? It was gone. Hmm. Well, maybe Exercise, muscular tension, all that stuff. Now, I've learned a lot about it since, but at that time, I said, okay, exercise is it. So I became a little bit of an exercise buff. Now, nothing, nothing dramatic, nothing like that. I've just a little floor exercise, push-ups, knee bends, and so forth. So that got me started down the path of maybe I better start taking care of my body and I better be alert. So that was the beginning. And then later I learned about the, the necessity of, of minerals, especially um, trace minerals and the importance they have on the, the um, neurological system. And a lot of the diseases, neurological diseases I discovered were really traceable to uh, a lack of some trace mineral. Although that was not in the prime literature, I found that in alternative literature. And I talked to some people and they verified, yep, they got rid of some rather serious neurological diseases by taking trace minerals, selenium and things like that, molybdenum. And uh, so that got me thinking, hmm, maybe I need to look at alternative medicines. So to make a long story short, I gradually developed the opinion and the attitude that health does not come from a test tube. It comes from nature. And nature re requires motion, some action. It requires clean food. It requires avoiding toxic things. And that's about it. So my job, I felt, was to avoid toxicity as best I could and to eat good, clean food, which didn't have additives put in it, and to eliminate sugar. Well, I never eliminated sugar, but I reduced it quite a bit. And did pretty well on all the other things because my wife was very good about these things and she took care of me. 
and she made it easy for me to eat well and so forth. Now, I'm coming to the end of this story. This is about all I do. I try and eat good food. I, I gave up drinking. I was a pretty heavy drinker when I was in my 30s, 40s. I was doing what young guys do. And I got rid of that. And um, I never smoked. I smoked a pipe for a little while. I thought it would make me look distinguished, <laughs> make me look like I was a writer or something, an intellectual man. I got rid of the pipe. And uh, so I've never been a smoker. Uh, I guess I came to the end of my story. Oh, there's one thing. I'm working on that now. And that is I, I discovered a, a product. comes from nature, by the way. It's found in the astragalus plant, which is generally considered to be an herb. And um, the substance in its purified form is called uh, cycloestrogenol. And it's very expensive. And, uh, but I, I bought a couple of bottles of it. And uh, the story behind it, with quite a bit of science, also laboratory ex record uh, experimentation and research to prove these points, that this um, substance, cycloestrogenol, in your bloodstream causes your normal cells to excrete, um, oh, let's see if I can think of the name now. It's, it's an enzyme. Anyway, I'll think of it in a moment. That helps to extend the telomeres on your, on your cells. The telomeres mm -hmm. are like those, they say they're like little uh, shoelace caps on the end of a shoelace. But they're at the end of your cell, your DNA, the twisting part. Comes to the end, they got telomeres, like little caps on them, like plugs. And every time your, your cell goes through apoptosis, which means it dies healthily, it dies in a healthy way to be replaced by a new cell. Um, a little piece of the, oh, telomerase is the, is the enzyme. A little piece of the um, cap comes off. And then you can develop a new cell, exactly like the old cell, but this time it's a new one. So it's not the old one, not getting tired. It's exactly like the new one, except the telomere is a little shorter. Well, you can go through so many cycles of that. And the first thing you know, the telomeres are gone and the cell won't reproduce anymore. And that's called end of the line. That's what the theory is, that that's the, that's the end of your normal life cycle. And there's not much you can do about it. And the, But the research showed that this... Uh, this telomerase that causes the cell to grow a new telomere extension is found in stem cells, which are cells which can reproduce for a long, long, long period of time, even indefinitely, as long as they have nutrition. So adding this, it's a long story, adding this uh, 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 cycloestrogenol to a little pill, taking your pill, it's supposed to, I say it's supposed to, cause normal cells, not the stem cells, cause normal cells to excrete telomerase. And that will cause the telomere to extend on a normal cell. I thought, well, how cool that is. Let's try it. So I've been on that about seven or eight years. I, now, is it causing my telomere uh, to grow longer? I don't know. <laughs> I've been taking it for seven years and uh, I don't intend to stop no. uh, so the reason I mention is because I was just recently talking to a, uh, somebody that produces nutritional supplements uh, and I'm asking could you make this stuff for me and I want some other things I want to add to it things like NN dimethylglycine which is sometimes called vitamin B15 has great longevity effect by itself. Hmm. And then there are some other things that, that uh, stimulate NAD, and those are all longevity factors. So I want to sort of up the ante a little bit and see if, I, if, I, if my hair starts going dark and see what happens. <laughs> I'll let you know how it works out. So just to cap it off, I have no secrets. It's just I'm doing I'm fiddling around with some unusual stuff. But I think the secret, if, if there is a secret, is to avoid toxicity as much as you can. That's the killer right there. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask you, I love asking people about books that they recommend. 
I know you're a big reader and you you can have a pile of books that you would recommend to people, but I'm wondering if there are a few that you particularly hope people would read. Oh, sure. I have a couple of favorites. They're fundamentals. They're the ones that sort of set me on my path too. When my kids were growing up, we had to, a little allowance program going. I think it was 25 cents a week or something like that. And uh, no big deal. But they thought it was a big deal. And uh, uh, But I said, I'll, you have to earn your allowance. Well, how? Well, you have to read something. So I give them things to read. And I gave them a couple of books. And they had to show progress every week that they'd read at least a couple of pages of the book. And what, what were they? Well. The first one, I suppose, would be um, Frederick Bastiat, The Law. It's a a seminal work. It's written over 150 years ago. Supposedly supposedly a transcript of a letter that Frederick Bastiat wrote to his fellow members of the French parliament this is back before the, you know, the times of the French Revolution and all this political activity going on. And um, he actually didn't deliver the speech before the assembly because he was, he was ill. He was dying of, um, I think it was TB, sort of the same as uh, Orwell. Anyway, so, but he wrote this thing, is called The Law. And I was so impressed by it because he spelled out all the, all of the mistakes, the logical errors of what he called socialism, but what I'm referring to now is collectivism, in such a clear fashion that I, at the time, thought it was worthwhile. I, I took the book, it was a little thin book, and I spoke it into the microphone, and I recorded it, and uh, I, I put a little echo effect on it as though I'm, I'm delivering it before a large group of people and I tried to make my voice sound a little bit like I was speaking to a group of people, you know, make it sound like this was Frederick Bastiat 150 years ago speaking to the French Parliament. And uh, we have that as a record, actually. We give away and sell some. Anyway, that would be one. And let's see, another one would be um, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Tremendous book. Uh, I don't know if you've read it or not, but for your no. for your listeners, I thought a title, Economics in One Lesson. How absurd. Uh, economics is very complicated. There's no one lesson. It's a, it's a complex of many lessons and sub-lessons. And who's going to do it in one lesson? But I got the book. And uh, by the time I reached page 15, I think, I was converted. He had nailed the one lesson. And uh, here it is. As if I can get it straight, it's been so long since I thought about this. He said, uh, to evaluate the economic merits or demerits of a proposal, one must consider not only the immediate effect on one individual, but also the long-range effect on all other individuals. Hmm. Wow. And then uh, the rest of the book was all to illustrate the wisdom and accuracy of that statement. So I, I put that on the list. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, oh, The Mainspring of Human Progress by Henry Grady Weaver. Weaver was an uh, engineer, was not a historian. But he did a magnificent job of recording history from a particular perspective, which was he wanted to find out what was, if anything, common to all periods throughout history where there were great splashes of, uh, of freedom, artistic creativity, development of new technology, all the creativity and liberty came, it seems like in spurts a little if you put it on a chart, he made the chart showing that there was a particular period over in even Arabia, uh, development of the Arabic Arabic letters and numbers and so forth, math, all these things. And he said, okay, what was the common thing to all of these spikes throughout history and all around the world? And he said it was the 
degree to which the government left people alone. <laughs> it was <laughs> as simple as that. Some of them were totalitarian governments, but they weren't very good at it. They only affected a few people. And some were not as totalitarian, but they were very good at it. And they covered everybody and just whacked the heck out of the whole nation by, you know, stealing too much of the productivity of the hardworking people. So that was, I thought, a very important lesson. Oh, and the, the final one was uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. Hmm. It's actually a little booklet, I think, as I remember. And it was a fictional story, of course, but it was, the principle was that, uh, boy, if I can summarize this, this young man wanted to learn how to become wealthy. So he found the wealthiest man in the community, in his little village. And he went to him and said, can you teach me how to become wealthy? There's something like this. Anyway, the man said, yes, well, we're going to go through a, a, a learning process. And it's quite interesting. And, uh, but I'm going to cut to the chase. Um, this young man does what he's told. And he saves his money. The principle it was to save your money, a little bit of it. Don't spend it all. Save a little bit. Every time you have a payment for, for effort or labor, save some of it. Until finally the saving gets to the point where you can invest it in something and make your money work for you instead of you working for the money. Okay. And then you just keep doing that. And when you investment pays something back, let it ride, let it accumulate and, you know, um, compound it. And by the time you reach middle life, if you've done your job well, you'll be wealthy like me. So the young man goes through the process. And of course, he loses his money that he invests because he came back and he said, oh, master, he said, I did exactly as you told me, but I lost all my money. And so he said, well, how did you tell me what you did? Well, he said, well, I have this money. It wasn't a lot, but the, uh, the uh, caravan guy came through, the rug, the rug maker came through on his camel and uh, I spoke to him about investments and he said he had a wonderful investment because he knew somebody back in his hometown which had some valuable jewels, the very jewels that he was willing to sell at a great discount. And uh, I could make a very fine markup profit by taking my money and investing it in precious jewels. And I did it. But when I got the jewels and I brought them back home, I found out that they were fake. They were not what they were supposed to be, and they were worthless. Okay, so now we come to the, the richest man in Babylon story. He said, well, you missed, you missed uh, one of my points, and that was that when you make an investment, make it with a person who has proven knowledge and success in the field in which he is asking you to invest, hmm. not somebody that just heard about something. And so then the young man went back and redid his thing again. And by the time he's older, he comes back and the old, old boy, the old boy is dead, but now the new kid is now the wealthiest man in Babylon. And then, so I thought it was a good lesson for young people to learn. Yeah. I definitely agree with that. Well, those, those are the four books, as I recall, that I, I asked my four kids to read before they, they got their allowance each week. <laughs> those are good reading assignments. Um, before we wrap up, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to sit with me today and talk with me because it's been an amazing conversation. I've been looking forward to this one for a long time. Um, I want to hand it over to you to share with listeners where they can learn more about you, where they can find your work, uh, where they can find Red Pill University, anything else you want to share. Well, thank you for that. I think I've taken up enough of everybody's time, so I'll make this very sh short. We, If you're interested in the kind of literature that we're talking about and the kind of stuff that I've been exposed to over the years, we have the best of the best in our website called the Reality Zone. And that's where we have books and recordings video and audio on these and many more similar uh, uh, topics of interest. 
And we've we've vetted them pretty caref- carefully. I've read everything in them, of course, and I, I highly approve of them. Uh, some things that, you know, I would ask people to read that I don't approve of, like Hitler's Mein Kampf, for example. I think you should read Das Kapital and Communist Manifesto. I think you should read those things. You need to read uh, Mao Tse Tung's Little Red Book. You need to, yeah, I recommend you read those things. That doesn't mean I like what's in them. But you need to know how these people talk and how they can trick you. So um, that that you would start there if you wanted some more information. Uh, but where we really get things, oh, also I have a free news service. If you want to find out what I think about the news, we publish a news report three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and it's free. You just go to um, realityzone.com, realityzone.com, and just sign up. It's free. And I think you're going to like what we do there. We we pick the best stories of the week or the two-day period in the week that has some kind of a message in it. It's not just what happened, to whom, and how. But these are stories that have some significance to what happened, to whom, and how. And uh, I personally go to great lengths to condense the whole story down to a, a couple of sentences, like a summary at the beginning. Because I know people are in a big hurry. They have a life to lead. And um, they can't read all these long stories. So I figured, bring this the essence of it to the top. And uh, and then if you find something in there that you think, now that interests me, then you can go click and read the whole story if you wish. So that's, uh, that you can go there. And then finally we have um, our Red Pill Project where we are trying to reach out to the to the rest of the people in the world and trying to get organized, come together and build this movement that I've been talking about. We are building this movement now. And we do it under this banner of red pill. Now, it may sound like it's frivolous, but if you understand the, you know, the meme, take the red pill, man, and wake up, see how life the way it really is, it makes a lot of sense. And there's sort of, I confess, we kind of popularized that idea uh, so that more people would take an interest in it. So if you want to find out how to get involved with fighting back, how to change the world for a change instead of just complain about it, this is where you'd start. And I would go to redpilluniversity.org and the sister organization, redpillexpo.org. We have a Red Pill Expo coming up in November. 15th, 16th, and 17th in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You need to come to that. Or if you can't come, you can, of course, watch it live stream. But this is where people come together and meet each other and form highly personal relationships. Now, you you can't win a war sending emails to your friends or yeah. watching videos on it. You've got to get out there on the streets and or in the institutions, go to the power centers, the political parties, the labor unions, the social groups, uh, universities, the media centers. Do what you're doing. You know, put on a podcast. Reach out to more people. Become an influencer, not just a, a person that's saying, oh, I wonder what's going to happen next. So that's where you start down that path is redpilluniversity.org and redpillexpo.org. Other than that, I'd like to repeat what I said before, for those of you who are interested, and I hope it's everybody, you want to take a look at this, the chasm. You can get that for free as a download at chasm.realityzone.com. That's about it. Awesome. Jared Griffin, it's been an honor talking to you today. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. And keep up the good work, young fellow. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. It goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab, where you can find my Amazon affiliate store where I have brands that I personally use, and fractalzoo.net, which is where I have unique fractal-inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media, on X at RDTM Podcast and Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.